Hey, everyone. I'm Jason Weiser. And I'm Carissa Weiser. And you may know us from our award-winning podcast, Myths and Legends, but now we've partnered with Cast Media to create a new podcast called Scoundrel, History's Forgotten Villains, a series that tells the true stories of some of yesterday's most fascinating forgotten bad guys. For example, you'll follow the career of Sidney Gottlieb, not only learning that through Sidney and his CIA team, the U.S. literally sanctioned mind control experiments and torture. But the story will open a window allowing you to really feel what Cold War America was like. Each episode will feature a new villain and a new time period you may not have heard about, but really should. So if you like crime, evildoers, and the darker parts of history, join us on Cast Media's new podcast, Scoundrel, History's Forgotten Villains, every week, wherever you get your podcasts. Ten six o'clock report with Mark McClure and Lisa George. Ducky Ball with sports and Gil Patrick's weather. About the murder investigation of a Jeff Davis County teenager whose body was found yesterday afternoon in nearby Montgomery County. Well, and this car was found about 10:30 Thursday night on this small dirt road just off a highway about a mile and a quarter outside the Hazelhurst city limits. The lights were on, the motor running, the door open with the emergency brake on. The murder investigation of a Jeff Davis County teenager whose body was found yesterday afternoon in nearby Montgomery County. A News Center 10's Robert Heidrich reports. Investigators believe that Coleman was abducted by someone she knew. One of the bad things about it is that the criminals are not being punished. It's a quiet spring night in 1990. Three men are fox hunting in a secluded area of rural South Georgia. They stand patiently by their pickup truck, having a cigarette and a beer or two, enjoying the cool night air and the endless star-filled sky strewn over God's country. They're pulled off the side of a dirt road and wait silently for the sound of their dogs barking to alert them to game nearby. What they hear instead is a vehicle racing down the road towards them. As the vehicle speeds by, the men hear a woman scream. As this general area is known as sort of a lover's lane, they think nothing much of it. Probably teenagers out having a good time. Sue Coleman never made it home from a social event for her high school. Now her family is behind. Her car was found just up the road. Lights on, engine running. Her parents say she would only stop for someone she knew. They have information that they feel could help us in this case. We want them to come forward. Not until the next morning, when news broke that 18-year-old Rhonda Sue Coleman had gone missing the night before, did the pieces fit together a little more clearly. The scream they heard was not that of a young girl having a good time. It was almost certainly a terrified plea. One last desperate attempt to get someone's attention. It was a cry for help. Now, after 30 years, mystery still surrounds that night. A family demands answers. And a town wonders aloud exactly what happened to Rhonda Sue Coleman. As for the fox hunters, would any of this ever have happened if they had only followed the scream, the cry for help? If only. From Imperative Entertainment, this is Fox Hunter. My name is Sean Kipe, and I'd like to impart one small piece of wisdom upon you, if I may. Indulge me. As I've gotten older, I've found that there are times in your life when you're called on to take part in something bigger than yourself, something you're probably not even ready for. It blindsides you, catches you off guard. It's rare and hardly ever ends the way you expect that it will. I've also found that 
times like these are when you're given the unique opportunity to surprise even yourself with what you're capable of, to learn and grow as a person. For me, one such opportunity came in the form of an email from a man named Jody Ponsell, a retired special agent with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Now working as a private detective, Jody heard my last podcast, In the Red Clay, and thought I might be interested in, as he puts it, bringing another story back from the shadows, referring to the unsolved murder of a young Georgia girl. And I'd come to learn that one thing this story has in spades is shadows. On the surface, this might seem like your run-of-the-mill true crime saga, and in some ways, sure, it is. But the more I researched and the deeper I dove into the murder of Rhonda Sue Coleman, the more I found myself spiraling further and further down into a seemingly bottomless pit of unlikely suspects, unanswered questions, small town rumors, and a spider web of evidence that just didn't seem to add up. Rhonda's murder in May of 1990 left a void in the small town of Hazelhurst, Georgia. A void that exists to this day. It has captivated the town of Hazelhurst in a way that few crimes like this do. Rhonda's family, friends, and even complete strangers have searched hopelessly for answers for the past 30 years. How could this happen in our little town? Who would do such a thing to a beautiful, promising young woman like Rhonda? Questions like these have echoed repeatedly throughout the past three decades. And as for the opportunity to be part of something bigger than yourself, well, I've made it my personal mission to do everything I can to help the Coleman family find out who took their only child from them. And I may fail. In fact, it's probable. But Rhonda's story deserves to be told. In the memory of her, never forgotten. On a cold January day, I made the four-hour drive from Atlanta, Georgia to Hazelhurst which sits about 100 miles west of the port city of Savannah. The sun had sunken below the horizon well before I arrived, and as I approached the outskirts of town, I was welcomed with long stretches of two-lane roads cloaked in total darkness. On either side of me, blackness. No streetlights, no businesses, and for the most part, no other cars on the road. Just silhouettes of pine trees and swaths of farmland covered in night. I checked into one of the three small hotels in the nearby town of Baxley, because they actually had a national chain hotel there. I got some rest, woke up early, and headed out. I had come down to Hazelhurst to meet Jody, the private detective who first contacted me, and be introduced to Rhonda's parents, Milton and Gail Coleman. They asked to meet me in the parking lot of the Jeff Davis County Courthouse in the center of Hazelhurst, and as I made my way there, I could now understand why it was so dark the night before when I arrived. Because there's nothing there. And don't get me wrong, it's beautiful out here, but for the most part on the outskirts of town, it's just farmland and row after row of pine trees planted in perfectly straight lines. It's sparse and open and very quiet. There are peanut and cotton fields, and you can see where the cotton has collected like tiny white tumbleweeds on the sides of the road. As I got closer to downtown Hazelhurst, small buildings began to pop up. A farm supply store here, a McDonald's or Walmart there, and at the center of town, the county courthouse. This is as typical of small town America as it gets. And when I pulled in, I was immediately greeted by a man that bounced up out of a small sedan with a huge smile on his face. That's Jody. Good morning. Hey, Sean, how are you, buddy? How you doing, Jody? I'm good. Nice good to, meet to meet you. you. Yeah. Put a face with a mouth. Yeah, it's a little nippy this morning. Within minutes, a large pickup truck pulls into the parking lot, and two people hop out and say their hellos. That is the Coleman. All right. Good morning. Milton, how are you? Good. Milton, Sean, type, nice to meet you. For now, Sean. Nice to meet you, man. Gail? Sean. Sean, yeah. Okay. So we're here. Cold this morning. Yeah, it is. <laughs> About 41, 42. Yeah. It could be worse. <laughs> it could be worse. It could be worse. <laughs> if it's waiting to lay down, it wouldn't be bad. <laughs> it's so quiet. Is it always like this? Or is it just because it's a just sleepy Saturday morning? <laughs> Saturday morning. 
I usually get a good bit of traffic. They thanked me for meeting with them and taking the interest in telling their daughter's story. After making the introduction and a little small talk, Jody prepared to leave. He had actually just accepted a job as an investigator and would no longer be able to officially work on Rhonda's case as he had for the past four years. I think he was so happy when I arrived because he was able to pass the torch on to someone and not feel like he was abandoning the Colemans. So now it's on me. And as it turns out, there was a reason we met at this particular spot. It's the last place Rhonda was seen alive by anyone other than her killer. It's a funny thing we met there. Why is that? It's a for Milton King Hardy. Looking for just the little hardies right there. Yeah. This is actually for you. This is where it started that night. Yeah. We stopped that there. And this is where it starts for me. After Jody left, Milton, Gail, and I went to the Huddle House Diner nearby to get breakfast and get acquainted. We made small talk and chatted about all sorts of things, from where I grew up to how small Hazelhurst is, even though it's grown considerably over the years. I immediately liked Milton and Gail, and within minutes, a high school friend of Rhonda's couldn't help but pop over and say hi to them and joined us. She affectionately called Milton and Gail Mama and Daddy, which immediately gave me a sense of how close people are here. With the four of us now at the table, the conversation quickly turns to Rhonda. They start spitting out names and dates and places, and all I could do was try to keep it all straight. Leroy's track, walk to the car, come back. Layla's Miller, Layla walked that quick car off. She turned the car off. Was Layla, was Layla the first one there? Yeah, Layla. Layla I was just going to say, yeah, Layla, Layla was the first one there. Layla, right? Layla, Layla she, went, she was on her way home and seen yeah, Rhonda's car. Yeah, exactly. And then she went on home and back, told her mama about it, and her mama... Um, Okay, so before I get ahead of myself here, let me give you a little background. Otherwise, all the names and places these people are referring to will make zero sense. And I'll tell you right now, there are a lot of people involved in this. So it's best to just start at the beginning. Thirty years ago, Hazelhurst was merely a blip on the map. It had less than 4,000 people. And although it's grown in size over the years, Hazelhurst was then, and still is, a small, close-knit community of ordinary people. People that take care of and look out for one another. They babysit each other's kids, they have cookouts on the weekend, work and hunt together, see each other at school and church. Hazelhurst consists of farmers and skilled laborers mainly. Most of the factories and textile mills have long since closed or moved to places like Mexico, where the labor is cheaper. Now the town survives almost entirely on just a few main industries. Farming crops like cotton for one, but as Milton drove me around to see Hazelhurst, he explained the basic economy of the area. Farm farm is big here. Uh, Cotton and peanuts, mostly. Cotton and peanuts. Uh, You got some soybeans and wheat. That's basically most of it. We still got a little bit of tobacco growing, not much. Uh, we still got a few cows like Chip there. He's a pharmacist, but he's got his farm out here. But what you might say is the true lifeblood of Hazelhurst now? Timber. Uh, Beasley Timber owns two sawmills here. I saw a huge one as I was coming in from Baxley. The largest hardwood producer in the United States. I mean, in the world. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I saw... And now the fields with row after row of perfectly planted pine trees I saw everywhere in the area makes a little more sense. You know, you got from the stuff he's cutting in the woods to the to lumber to being the wood pellets, heating pellets. Yeah. Uh, shavings, anything to do with lumber. Being the hardwood flooring... When I say timber is a big deal here, it is. And that's going to be an important factor later in our story. How many free trial subscriptions end up costing you hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, long after forgetting to cancel? Fight back against scammy subscriptions with Truebill. 
Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 per year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions so hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. And your Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel any unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. Truebill has over 2 million users and helped save them over $100 million. Like Jennifer B., who says, With your help, our family has saved $587 per year on unnecessary subscriptions. I really didn't understand how Truebill could help me until we decided to save for a very large home purchase. So don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash TrueCrime. Go right now. Truebill.com slash TrueCrime. It could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash TrueCrime. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Well, of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, GEICO can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app available 24-hour roadside assistance and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you can save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to geico.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. Milton retired from working as a lineman for Southern Bell Telephone Company, but he's one of those I can't sit still for too long kind of people and eventually went back to work doing small construction jobs to keep busy. Gail retired as well from her career in secretarial work. They've been married for 50 years and were high school sweethearts meeting back in 1967. Lord, at, we were at the movie theater. I don't remember it, but he remembered. I remember it down to the T. <laughs> he said he was walking around. You know, you used to walk around and the guys would spot girls and the girls would walk around and spot guys. <laughs> anyway, I had real long hair at that time. And I was leaning back and had my hair thrown across the back of the seat. And he walked by and seen that long hair. And That's all it took. I, I, I just made me another circle and crawled over and sat outside of her. <laughs> 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 and after we got out of high school, we, 19, we got married. Not long after they were married, the young couple were expecting. We were living in a little apartment uptown and both of us working and we were happy and didn't have any problems, and we finally moved out and got a little bit bigger place. Uh, my mom, my mother was off of work for some reason, and he would take me over at, at the end of my pregnancy. He would take me to her house every morning to stay with her while he went to work. I was staying over there with her, and I was sitting on the front porch. My water broke. It scared me, huh? <laughs> you know, <laughs> go in there and tell mother. She said, well, come on, let's go to the hospital. She writes a note and puts it on the mantle and, and, for Milton and, and says, go on to the hospital. No, it says, go on to McCray. Go on to McCray. So he comes in, he sees that sign. This time my dad's come home and he's got supper going or finishing it. And so him and dad sits down and eats. <laughs> well, no, I called, uh, I called a hospital. Yeah, that's right. Asked if they admitted Gail Coleman. No, we hadn't admitted her. Called the doctor's office. No, we hadn't seen her. So I said, well, me and, me and Paul sit down and eat supper. <laughs> <laughs> See how the man folks are around there. Gail gave birth to baby Rhonda on January 18th, 1972. It wasn't an easy start for the young family, though, trying to make ends meet with a new baby. Oh, I loved it. Yes. I loved it. Gail had uh, some complications after the baby was born. and. Uh, had to carry her back to the hospital. And I worked all day and stayed up all night with the baby. <laughs> I, I prop my eyelids open literally like that to feed the baby at night. At night. <laughs> For about a week, you know, when Gail, while Gail was in the hospital. And, uh, but Granny kept it in the daytime and I kept it at night. And like I said, I'd check on Gail every day. And, but we had a, we had a good, 
you know, a good life with her. Young Rhonda grew before their very eyes. Kids have a way of doing that. And it became clear early on that she was an outgoing, caring little girl who made friends easily. When we lived uptown, our yard joined another yard. And there was two girls over there, and they were just constantly back and to with each other. I mean, she was, she was outdoors. She was going to play, or she was, you know, I can still see her come running across that backyard, them little legs coming home. I wanted to get to know who Rhonda really was from the beginning of her life. I feel like even the smallest detail of her personality, her interests, could tell me a lot. Very loving, outgoing person. Even even as a child, she would help anybody that needed help. It's going on through, you know, especially when she got up in her teenage years, she was like the mother hen. And laugh, oh, she had a contagious laugh. She would toss that head back and open that mouth and she would laugh and just, you couldn't help <laughs> You'd have to laugh with her. The years that followed were the Coleman's very own little piece of the American dream. Life was good. Rhonda was a healthy and happy child. She was smart and beautiful with curly blonde hair past her shoulders, and she had her mother's bright blue eyes. If only Milton and Gail could have known then just how precious those memories would be. Throughout the 1980s, Rhonda Sue Coleman grew into a nature-loving, adventure-chasing, all-American country girl. It seemed there was nothing that could tame her wild spirit. She enjoyed the outdoors. She loved to fish. She was a country girl. Back then, it was three-wheelers. She had three-wheelers. Go-kart. One day, she wanted a motorcycle. And Milton told her, well, you save half the money, and I'll give you the other half. How long was it? Three months. I had to buy Three months. <laughs> she had to buy, he had to buy her a little motorcycle. She loved horses. Uh, she had a horse. Milton and Gail's house became the hangout spot for Rhonda and her friends. They had a swimming pool, 20 acres of land to explore and play on. The Colemans would take Rhonda's friends with them on vacation to the beach or to the lake to go boating and water skiing. They wanted to learn to water ski. She always wanted to ski slot them, one ski. And I was trying to teach her, but she... She had fallen, couldn't get up on one. I said, baby, just drop one, and then you stuck your foot back. Anyway, she hit a big wave, and she liked to fail, and she dropped that left ski, and she just took that foot right on back, and she slot them. From then on, she was slot them. <laughs> she thought that was something, you know, she was on one ski. You know how when you were a kid, there was always that one friend whose parents were cool and everyone hung out at their house? Well, that was the Coleman's. It was a perfect life in a perfect small town. I'm torn between these two definitive feelings of happiness and sadness as I listen to Milton and Gail talk about Rhonda. I can tell that they love to relive these fond memories. It brings a smile to their faces, though it also brings the harsh reality that she's gone. But in May of 1990, as Rhonda's high school graduation neared, she was excitedly planning out her future and already seemed to know the path her life was on. She was happy and content. Milton and Gail vividly remember the day Rhonda told them she had chosen which college she would attend. It's a day they'll never forget. Georgia Southern at Statesboro. Nursing. She wanted to work in the nursery with the newborns. Matter of fact, we still got her letter that she had written to one of the colleges. On May 17th, after having this talk with her parents, Rhonda left to attend a senior class function at a classmate's house. I guess around seven or so, she went to town to do the senior flag at it, Mickey Beecher's house. That's where he was all, he had a big shop out there, daddy did, where he could, uh, everybody could get together and paint up the senior flag. Painting senior flags was sort of a rite of passage for the outgoing senior class each year. They would paint their names and sayings that were important to them at the time, best wishes, hopes and dreams, on large pieces of carpet backing and hang them around the school halls for their final week. And the thing about this is we never let her go out on a school night. 
But since this was a special occasion, we let her go. That night, Rhonda got in her car and left for the party. And this is where everything changed for Milton and Gail Coleman. This was the last time they would see their daughter alive. We all want love, that happily ever after feeling of finding your soulmate. What if someone not only claimed they could help you find that perfect partner, they guaranteed it? Jeff and Shalia, a young couple famous on YouTube, teach about twin flames, a deep romantic connection with your perfect ultimate partner in their videos. It's a divine love. You're designed for no one else, and they're designed for no one else. But the path to finding your twin flame isn't so simple. Those who start to doubt the group are instructed to cut ties with friends and family that are holding them back and to corner and claim their twin flame through stalking and intimidation. By the time some members are able to leave the group, they don't even recognize themselves and the harassment to rejoin makes them fear for their safety. From Wondery, Twin Flames is a podcast about what happens when the quest for love turns into a dangerous obsession. Follow Twin Flames on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. I sat down with the Colemans at their home on a Saturday afternoon, along with their rescue dog, Missy, who you'll probably hear from time to time, and they laid out a timeline of the events that were to become the most painful of their lives. I was sitting right there in a rocking chair, and she came in, leaned over the rocking chair there, and gave me a kiss and said she was fixing to go. And I sat there and I watched her walk out the door. So we're going to say it was, it was pretty close to 7, if not 7. And then she was supposed to be home at 10.30, and she was at home. When Rhonda wasn't home by her 10.30 p.m. curfew, Milton immediately knew something was off. Rhonda was very punctual, always. You know, I dozed off sleep and I woke up, she wasn't home and she always called. She'd always call me and say, Daddy, gonna be 10 minutes late. It ain't no problem. Let me know. Maybe she had a flat tire or maybe her car broke down. In 1990, no one had a cell phone, so she could just be stuck and not near a payphone. So Milton decided to head into town to look for Rhonda. And just a few short miles from their home, something caught his eye. So she uh, didn't call, and about 11.30 or so, I got up and went looking for her. And that's when I seen the blue lights and found a car, and Layla and Debbie Sheriff was already there. Rhonda's white 1989 Chevy Cavalier was pulled off the main road onto a small dirt road, and a deputy who Milton knew named Leroy Sanders had just arrived. One of Rhonda's high school classmates who Milton knew as well, Layla Miller, was wandering around nervously and calling out for Rhonda, who was nowhere to be found. Milton's uneasy feeling began to grow. Well, uh, you know, at first I said, well, there's been an accident, you know, and I seen her car, you know, I said, it's just an accident, you know, but she should be fine, you know. And I pulled in and uh, Leroy Sanders, which was the deputy, was walking up to the car. And uh, when I drove up, and he walked back to meet me. Deputy Sanders explained to Milton the situation at hand. Layla and Rhonda were friends in school. She's actually a neighbor that lives right up the road, uh, a couple of miles up the road from us. And she was on the way home too when she found Rhonda's car. She pulled over and thought maybe Rhonda was just using the bathroom or sick and she called out and no answer. and. And when she didn't answer, she knew something was probably wrong. Uh, the car was left running, the door standing open. Yeah, her purse was still laying right there in the seat. Layla Miller was on her way home from her boyfriend's house nearby when she passed by the car pulled off the side of the road. As she got closer, she realized that it was Rhonda's car and turned around to see if she was okay. What she found was Rhonda's car still running, headlights on, driver's side door wide open, and her purse still lying on the front passenger seat, but no Rhonda. She called out and looked around the area, 
but nothing. The only clues at the scene were a set of footprints from Rhonda's car to another vehicle's tire tracks. She knew it wasn't like Rhonda. She knew that something was wrong. Layla switches the car off, then she goes back to her boyfriend's house and calls, I think she called her mama then, and then they called the sheriff's department. Like every true Southern girl knows, when in doubt, ask your mama. Both Layla and her mother thought something was off and had called the police just in case. And by now, the gravity of the situation was starting to set in with Milton. She was missing and, and we knew that wasn't like her. And uh, I was upset. Uh, I had to call Gail and tell her that she was missing. And it was very upsetting. And I said, well, maybe she's, she got sick or something. She maybe went to the hospital or something. You know, we said, well, maybe some of her friends knows her, you know, where she's at. So the Debbie and I get in the sheriff's car and we rode up to Hardy's, which is a mile and a half away. And we seen, the first two people we seen was Mickey Beecher, which was his house where the flag was going on, and Shane, and Shane Norman. And we asked him if they seen Rhonda. And they said, no, not since the party. And they said, what's going on? I said, well, she's missing. Milton and Leroy knew that Rhonda wouldn't still be at the flag painting party because it was at Mickey Beecher's house and Mickey Beecher was at Hardy's talking to them. They stepped next door to a diner where another deputy, Jerry Fisher, was having coffee and told him that they couldn't find Rhonda. He said, we need to call chief investigator, chief deputy. So we called him, which was Don Kramer, and we all went back out to the site to her car. By the time Milton and the officers arrived back at the location where Rhonda's car was found, word had traveled through the small town, and several of Rhonda's classmates were already there and looking for her. They didn't realize that it was potentially a crime scene and disturbed the few pieces of evidence that existed, the footprints and the tire tracks. When Don Kramer come up, he was, like I say, Chief Deputy. He walked around a few minutes and he said, we need to call the GBI. So they call the local GBI agent on call. Don is a friend, good friend, he knew Rhonda. Chief Deputy Don Creamer, being a family friend of the Coleman's, made this personal for him right from the start. And he wasted no time. He made the comment about, well, this, she just, this is not a runaway, this is not, we know. He knew that something was wrong, because Rhonda, you know, he knew Rhonda wouldn't do that. It was apparent that she left her car running. Uh, he knew something was wrong. And he's, Told him, told him he says, call out, call dispatch and find out where all the deputies was at and call them out. All the available deputies were called out to start working the scene, except for one who couldn't be reached. They said, he's already signed off for tonight. And this was approximately one o'clock. For several hours, Milton and Deputy Sanders continued asking any of Rhonda's friends they could reach if they had seen her. They went to her recent ex-boyfriend's house and drove the back roads while Gail was home frantically making phone calls to anyone she could think of. But there was nothing more they could do for the night. It's so dark in the rural areas that you could pass right by Rhonda, not even see her if she was injured on the side of the road. The police decided that they would reconvene in the morning. Milton and Gail retired to their home for a sleepless, anxiety-filled night. As the sun peeked over the horizon on May 18th, it became clear that Rhonda was missing. No one had heard from her, and no one knew where she was. By this time, the town was already buzzing, and search parties were being organized. Once the, her friends found out she was missing, they rode this county for three days just as hard as they could ride it all over. They searched the woods. They went to all the river landings, uh, all over this county, right, right in this county, trying to find her. Lord, the house was full. The yard was full of people. I mean, people just, they just coming and going, coming and going. I mean, you couldn't hardly walk out, walk outside. People just, you know, coming, wanting help, wanting to see what they can do. And just a great crowd. For three days, law enforcement, friends, family, and strangers searched for Rhonda. They rode backcountry roads, checked riverbanks, and used ATVs and even rode horseback to search fields in heavily wooded areas all over the county. Within 
36 hours, 20,000 flyers were handed out. Crowds of people stood vigil at the Coleman's house and tried their best to comfort Milton and Gail as hope of finding Rondo alive slowly dwindled. By Sunday, the crowd of supporters had grown considerably. That Sunday, there was probably 100 people in this yard that just showed up that afternoon trying to figure out what they could do or asking what they could do. Or... But what could they do? Offering support or lending a shoulder to cry on is admirable and necessary in a time like this. But really, how much of a difference does it make? I can't imagine how the Colemans felt during these few days, wondering where their little girl was. Was she scared, crying out for them? I'm scared that she's abducted and they, you know, they mistreating her and raping her. And it just, you know, it just goes over your head and how she might be suffering and hurting and wanting her mama, wanting her daddy to come get her. I mean, you just think everything. You don't sleep, you don't eat. People that loves you, they just don't know what to say. They didn't know what to say, they didn't know what to do. But they did what they needed to do. They were here. To say it's a living hell. I guess you could say it's a living hell. I don't know exactly what hell's like. I know what the Bible says about it. But when the one person that you love most in the world is missing and you can't help. You can't, you can't go get her. She needs her mama, she needs her daddy. We don't know where she's at and you just, it's like a big tunnel of just empty and you trying to breathe and there's this tunnel you're in and you can't get out of it. And, You just don't want to go on. She don't, she don't come home. She don't want to go home. Hearing Gail describe this experience was absolutely heartbreaking. And I'd be lying to you if I said my eyes weren't filling with tears when she talked. And Milton, the rock of the family, had his own hell to live while trying to be there for Gail, who was beginning to fall apart. Well, it's, it's like she said, it was living hell, you know, and me trying to find out what's going on, what the search is doing, what the police is doing, just the sheriff's department, and, and comfort Gail, too, and uh, it's, it was just hard to explain. It was just something you don't want to think about. And you've heard a, a mother's intuition. Yeah. Because when Milton called me that night and said, I found her car, but she's missing. I knew. I walked over to that door right there and went to hitting it with my fist, and I said, somebody's got my daughter. Gail wouldn't leave the house for fear of missing a call from Rhonda, even when a close family friend tried. The man that r raised Milton, Mr. Barney Kane, was out here. And one night he says, Gail, how about me taking you and Milton out to supper? We'll get you away for a minute. And I told him I couldn't. We, we couldn't go just in case she called. We still, we never did give up hope. We always, there was still a little bit of hope there. So I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to get away from the phone just in case. But that faint glimmer of hope that Milton and Gail were clinging to wouldn't last forever. I never gave up hope until they pulled up in the drive that Sunday. Roger Byrd, the state representative for the district at the time, had come to the Coleman's home with his wife to show their support and let them know he had authorized the use of helicopters to aid in the search. We were sitting here on the couch, and he said he'd called the helicopters, and it wasn't long. By the time he said that, we heard the helicopters coming across them trees, and that's when we went outside. Then about that time, the sheriff pulled up within 30 minutes or so. The yard was still full of people and everything, and I was sitting here on the porch with my sister, one of my other sisters, and Milton was out there, and when they pulled up in the driveway, the sheriff, Milton went out there and met him. And I had got up, was on my way walking out there. And 
And when they, Milton, they told Milton, I heard him holler. And I knew something. So we got through the crowd and the sheriff came over there and told me she was gone. On Sunday, May 20th, 1990, Rhonda Sue Coleman's body was found. She had been dumped in a wooded area roughly 15 miles from where her car was found and set on fire. She was 18 years old. And I tried to ask him, was she she tortured or anything? And he said he didn't know. I asked him, did my baby suffer? He said he didn't know right now. And that's when I collapsed and and everybody just screaming and hollering. I think, well, I know everybody, they still had that hope too. Everybody was still holding on to a little bit of hope. And that little bit of hope would be the only thing that would keep Milton and Gail Coleman going for the next 30 years, as they still struggle to find answers. Who and why would someone take their only child from them? Fox Hunter is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was created, written, and reported by me, Sean Kipe, and I wrote the original music score. Executive producers are Jason Hoke and Gino Falsetto. Story editor is Jason Hoke. Sound engineering by Shane Freeman. Key cover art provided by Joe Freeman Jr. Keychalis 9032, 2015. Jr.com. Fox Hunter is a 10-episode series available every Tuesday morning. Follow us on social media at Fox Hunter Podcast. If you like the show, leave us a review and tell your friends. Thanks for listening.